thanks everybody for coming and Zooming, and thanks for all the good man folks for making this happen. I see I've got some of my business ethics students here too. I'll try not to make you regret it. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so, um, in lovely introductions, pointed out I work in the field of moral psychology, which more or less studies how human minds make morality and in turn how morality makes human minds. Um, since around the late 1990s, it's safe to say the field has grown something like exponentially. When we did the first moral psychology handbook in 2010, it had 13 chapters and 400 odd pages and the handbook we just finished has 1,100 pages and 50 chapters. Um, <clears throat> So I'm trying to keep up. Um, <clears throat> just a note, since I'm a Dyson person, Cornell's the best place in the world to think about moral psychology, and a lot of people are management types in the, in the Dyson school, so that, that's pretty cool. And it turns out there's a lot of people working in management who do what I would call moral psychology, who don't necessarily self-identify that way, so it's a big tent. So today's talk is about recent collection of essays character trouble, which in part looks back at my dissertation book, Lack of Character, and wonders what happened in the ensuing, in the ensuing period. It'll be hard for me to stay tethered to this mic. Um, <clears throat> so the foil, I think, is a view we all recognize. Um, you could find these Heraclitus. Um, character is that, are these memes, are these little tiles that you find, are, are, are those memes? I, anyway, you can find a lot of these tiles on the internet, um, and in philosophy it especially plays out in um, Aristotle's monumental Nicomachean Ethics, but um, it's not just an ancient idea, here's Harry, Henry James, what is character but the determination of incident, what is incident but the illustration of character, um, and if it seems insightful about fiction, it's because people think it's insightful about people. Um, <clears throat> John McCain, in his I Want to Be President book, picks up on Heraclitus, um, character is destiny, and we find a lot of applications of this idea that the kind of person we are makes the life that we have. We find those kinds of ideas um, in all sorts of popular fora like parenting um, advice. We want to raise our kids to have, to have good character. <clears throat> so what's the problem? <clears throat> um, to put it in slightly more technical terms, traditional conceptions of character undermined by empirical research in psychology. That is, um, the ordinary way of thinking about character, which I'll say a little bit about, um, turns out to have relatively little empirical evidence speaking for it and a good deal of evidence speaking against it. So talking two numbers, first number 65%. Um, that's the number of um, percentage of subjects who were um, fully obedient in Stanley Milgram's um, Infamous Milgram experiment is probably the most important contribution to the social sciences um, of the last century. Who knows the Milgram experiments? You don't need to know much. I know you guys do. Um, I told you you'd regret coming. Um, um, so the basic picture, I, I won't go into great deal, but the basic picture is um, here's the subject. He comes in, um, although they did she's too, but mostly he's, and he comes in and um, is told he's going to participate in a study of how punishment affects, affects learning. And so then they, they draw straws, and the, there's an experimental stooge or confederate who's the learner. Of course, he starts messing up the test. The guy at the top, um, the experimenter, keeps telling the poor subject to continue, and 65% of the subjects continue shocking the victim who is eventually screaming and complaining of a heart condition um, behind the wall for as long as, for as, long as um, the experimenter tells them to. It's not that they did liked it or were sadists. It's that they 
were absurdly compliant. And what Milgram thought um, was that this showed it was um, all too easy to induce destructive obedience, and you don't need a totalitarian state or something like that to make it happen. I was going to show this today. I show it when I teach. But a very good way to spend 10 minutes would be to Google Darren Brown. Um, Milgram Experiments YouTube, and it's exact replication of Milgram on reality TV. The, um, if you're the kind of person who's heard about that psychology experiments don't replicate, um, this one does over and over and over all around the world. Um, <clears throat> OK. So that was in an exhibit in a fight in psychology. Um, Milgram's kind of finding that people can be sort of easily pushed around was an exhibit um, in this debate in psychology that became known as the person-situation debate, which pitted personality psychologists who said character traits, honesty, say, loyalty, generate cross-situationally consistent behavior, where that means if you have a trait, if I'm an extrovert, I can be expected to be chatty. OK, so if you know I'm an extrovert, you know what I'm going to do at the party. Um, and there's a large industry of this, particularly in personnel and HR, where they say things like personality is the driving force behind human behavior. Along come the social psychologists inspired by people like Milgram, um, <coughs> who notice that, in fact, behavior is pretty inconsistent about across situations. Sometimes the, the supposed extrovert is chatty, and sometimes she's quiet. And they concluded the, inf um, the influence of personality is actually pretty limited. OK. <clears throat> um, well, the ship of philosophy sails slowly, but eventually um, philosophers who spend a lot of time <clears throat> thinking about character got wor word um, um, about what was going on in psychology, um, particularly um, <clears throat> in addition to myself, my friend and mentor, Gil Harmon. Um, and there grew up in philosophy an analogous debate, which came to be called the virtue ethic situationist debate, where the people on the situationist side said, as a matter of fact, Cross-situationally character traits are not widely instantiated. Most people aren't like that. Most people are quite inconsistent. And then a prescriptive thesis or an ought, we should spend less time thinking about character. The translation, if you don't go in for descriptive and prescriptive and stuff like that, is character doesn't matter as much as people think, and we should be talking about it a lot less. <coughs> I think it's safe to say that the um, this was not, this seemingly reasonable suggestion was not met with unmixed enthusiasm. <clears throat> and um, one of my favorite episodes, and indeed one of my favorite episodes in my career, a philosopher and psychologist got together and got a multi million dollar Templeton grant. Templeton funds a lot of um, research on, in human morality. Um, and they proposed using the grant to establish a moral self-research network to counter John Doris's moral psychology research group. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what the effect that was, this was intended to have, but um, um, I guess my own view is if people are taking out multi-million dollar ad hominem grants, you're almost certainly <clears throat> doing something right. OK. Um, and just, just for a, a brief advertisement, Despite their best efforts, the moral psychology research group persists as it has for 20 years. And if you want more of this stuff, we have an online conference this weekend um, with some cool speakers and stuff. First time we've done anything online. OK, so personality psychologists say personality matters a whole lot. Social psychologists, not so much. The people following the social psychologists and Philosophy, like me, say, all the character stuff's kind of a waste of time. OK. Um, <clears throat> but we weren't, at that time, super sophisticated about how psychology works. So when I wrote the new book, 
you know, I sort of dug back in and tried to figure out better what was going on. I've never taken a psychology course, and so I certainly didn't know a lot about it when I was in um, <coughs> graduate school. Um, but I think it turns out um, the first book has aged better than I do and I th have, and I think it's um, fundamentally right, but I, I now see there are available arguments that make the case more strongly. Um, and that's what brings us to the second number. Um, it's a smaller number, and it matters that it's a smaller number. It's 0.3. Um, and the real question, I think, for thinking about the influence of personality or character on human life is an issue about how to think about effect sizes. Okay. <clears throat> Disclaimer, I'm not a psychologist. Um, and it, it's actually going to turn out to be telling that you don't need to know fancy stuff to know what's going on. The basic point is si pretty simple, and pretty much everybody agrees about it. Um, <clears throat> so two kinds of research questions. What are the morally relevant individual difference variables? Does type A personality matter? Does extroversion matter? I'm not going to worry about that at all. I'm only going to worry about to what extent to traits Whatever they are, influence moral cognition and behavior. Okay. So in 1968, super smart um, personality psychologist Walter Michel, who um, small world department um, was a graduate school mate of my father, published a book where he exhaustively sur exhaustively um, surveyed the personality literature up to that time, and what he noticed is that a correlation of about 0.3 is the upper limit for effect sizes in personality psychology. That is, pick a trait, pick a behavior of interest, that's the relationship size you're going to get. Okay? He called that the personality coefficient, and the first thought is that's a lot closer to no relationship than a perfect relationship like all humans are mortal, right? Okay, but we need to take some time to think about what that's supposed to mean. Um, I said it's not disputed. Both sides of the so-called person situation debate um, agree that's the effect size you're going to get, 0.3-ish, give or take. Okay, um, but the question is what, how to interpret it. So th this is actually kind of a remarkable episode, I think, in um, um, intellectual history, really smart stat statistician, Jacob Cohen, wrote this book, and he said, I've looked around the psychology literature, and here's what I'm going to tell you about effect sizes. Point 0.1 is small, point 0.3 is um, medium, and point 0.5 is large. And everybody said, well, Jacob Cohen's a way smart guy, so that's what we'll say. And so you still read this as people using this as a rule of thumb. Um, the problem is, is that um, <clears throat> it's an overly optimistic representation about what's going on in psychology. Okay, um, that is, well, I'll explain. Um, in clinical psychology, only a third of effects are larger than 0.3. In social psychology, half the effects are around 0.2. Okay, again, correlations. Um, 2.7 per individual differences research, which is just um, personality research, 2.7% of correlations, 50%, 0.5 or greater. Okay. John, can you define effect size? Is, is it correlating personality characteristics with discrete behaviors or continuous behavior? Here, here we're talking, so, so I think, I th for, for our purposes, let's imagine it's a trait in a discrete behavior, and what's the association? Oh, 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 okay. There's the, it, it turns out also, um, yeah. We should, we should, we should. I think for this, for this purpose, we should leave it like that. So you could, So if there's a large effect, you can be quite confident. I test out as an extrovert. I'm going to wear the lampshade at my head at the party. Um, if it's a small effect, you shouldn't be so confident. And there's, there's much fighting to be done about whether we should be thinking about particular behaviors or aggregates and so on and so forth and what that shows, but we'll, we'll, we'll leave that. <clears throat> um, so to just sort of, so here, just to kind of visualize this, 
there's clearly something about point three, right? Um, point three and down tends tend to be dumb. Um, the stronger effects tend to be in um, cognitive psychology, where the um, there's a lot of within person designs that are your performance on one test to the next, which is less noisy, so they're more reliable measures. Um, some of this, if you see, you should smell a rat uh, uh, um, in, 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 in psychology. Okay, so those are the distributions, so Cohen standards seem a little misleading. Um, famous paper by Meyer and colleagues said, it's true that effects in psychology are small, um, but that's nothing to be ashamed of. Compare medicine, well-funded, people spend a lot. Um, correlation between aspirin and reduced cardiac mor um, mortality, 0.02. Um, now that's a tricky case, so, um, because whose doctor tells them it's unequivocal that they should take aspirin? Um, as things start to thicken up. A, a, a lot of doctors say you must do this. So my friend, my best friend had an early heart attack and so he's been on aspirin for a long time, now he's got an ulcer. So that's the cost, right? Um, with not a huge bump, okay? So <clears throat> my colleagues say, look, psychologists should be rather satisfied with 0.11, that's less sniffles and antihistamine use. So I look at this and I say, well, antihistamines make me, make me feel pretty logy. Maybe that ain't worth it. Um, pleased with 0.26, that's gender and weight. Maybe it's kind of strikingly small. Um, and rejoice, they say, at 0.5, gender and arm strength. Notice when you get to gender and arm strength, that's something that's hard to miss if you go to the gym. Right, right. There will be exceptions. Here, and this is why I said you don't quite have to be a psychologist to have a pretty good sense of what's going on here. Um, um, a, when they, they study covariation paradigms, are you able to associate tone lengths and stuff like this? Um, and what around 0.15 going south of that, you won't notice. 0.3, Cohen himself said, which is again on the larger side. We're happy enough in the work we do in personality and social psychology to bring things. If we get a point two, we think we for sure found something, right? Something like a point four, um, unusual. Um, maybe we fudged it somehow. But point three, perceptible to the naked eye of a reasonably sensitive observer. So think about it this way. <clears throat> Sometimes I'm studying in man library when you're studying in man library. Right. If that correlates at 0.15, you won't be Doris is in the library a lot. 0.3, yeah, I see Doris at the library sometimes, but it won't be. There's that creepy guy in the library. For that, that's like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, okay, something that's dramatic, okay. So, what's to say? Most of the um, most of the relationships reported in the personality and social psychology literature are hovering at perceptible or below to the naked eye. This isn't necessarily wrong. If, 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 all, if we could see all the important stuff without statistics, we wouldn't need psychologists, right? Some of these effects are important, especially in the aggregate. <laughs> but the influence of character ain't supposed to be just perceptible. Heraclitus did not say character is perceptible sometimes. Right, right. Um, so <clears throat> the old wisdom, the claim is, is overturned. The old wisdom is overturned by systematic observation, not vindicated by systematic observation. <clears throat> Why so? Well, psychological phenomena tend to be multivariable. Particular variables seldom manifest large effect sizes. In psychology, all prediction is small prediction. Okay. Here's a lovely explanation um, from an important paper by Adi and Diener, which I'll read to you. To, to expect any psychological variable to correlate with some behavioral criterion on the order of 0.5 or greater is to deny the complexity of human behavior. 
It's a simple property of effect sizes that a number of independent determinants of some behavior increases the magnitude of the correlations between any one of the um, <coughs> determinants and, and the behavior must decrease. Okay, it's a mathematical property. <coughs> I was thinking about how to explain this this morning and I hit on food. So, so think about it this way. Should you splurge on the good olive oil? Well, if you're making a caprese, there aren't many variables, right? Right, right, right. So the olive oil can have a large effect size, right? So maybe you should spend more. By the way, I, I googled caprese salad and I got all these horrible pictures of overwrought gunk that wouldn't make my point. So I actually had to put in simple caprese salad to find a, uh, 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 an actual caprese salad. But now, supposing you're making Julia Child's wonderful casserole of pork, and you're going to put a tablespoon of olive oil in the marinade. Don't go so spendy. It's got to have a smaller effect size. So what's the point? Life is like casserole of pork and not caprese. OK? It, <laughs> it's close to a law of nature that character could not be destiny because we're complex beasts in complex environments. It's that simple. <clears throat> now you say, Doris, I don't, you know, you're talking about all these laboratory studies and correlations and stuff. Why should I believe that when I can see with my own eyes in real life how character works? So it's been my good fortune um, to collaborate occasionally with the brilliant um, <clears throat> personality psychologist Matthias Miel at Arizona, um, and he figured out a really cool way to, to look at life more directly. And he calls it the electronically activated recorder. There's a participant, they put the little pink triangle, so um, someone, this is for the IRB, right, so that people know they're being recorded, okay? And then you just take sample ambient sound, say 50 seconds every 18 minutes, when you think about it, um, a lot of what we do is audible. I want to know if, you're, if you watch TV five hours a day like Americans do or one hour a day like you say. Pretty good way to find out. Right? Pretty good way to find out. Now you might think, look, <clears throat> this ain't real life because they're going to be inhibited. They're going to be inhibited by the um, knowing they're being recorded. And here's, I have a bit of tech. So the claim is I can do this with my mousy. Okay, okay. So here's a couple of actual snippets I'll play. That's why I thought it was okay. No, I didn't see mom do it. I didn't see mom do it. I said, mom, should I set the cruise control at 80 all the way home? She's like, that's fine. And if she says anything different, it's a lie. Because you don't ever test my memory. My memory is perfect. Okay, snippet two. If you only knew so these people know they're being recorded. It would be to show me how you feel more than So we have a hard time believing that they're desperately inhibited by the presence of the um, recording instrument. The best guess, right, you forget, right? So, um, so what can we learn this, with this? Well, I went to Matthias and said, what about moral behavior? Um, and so we took a bunch of these sound files um, and had people code them for moral behavior. And our question was not quite about consistency, but say, do you behave the same way from one weekend to the next? Um, or at um, one health retreat at the next, or something like that, since Matthias is a health psychologist. Um, and we had people code the snippets for positive daily behaviors. You're learning a lot. You're doing great. Or negative daily beha behaviors. Then get off the butt, your butt and make them lunch. Um, and what did we find? Um, 
right? So it's a little bit better than the point three I was talking about, but not wildly better. We suspect that um, it's because the situations they were observed in were um, iterated instances of similar situations rather than truly diverse situations. And nobody denies that what you did in um, a situation, nobody denies that's a good predictor of what you'll do in a very similar situation. Um, so I claim this is the state of the art about figuring out how re regular people's behavior is, and it ain't that regular. So in thinking about what that 0.42 or 0.43 means, if, if people are just like randomly behaving, wouldn't it be 0.5? They're not dichotomous outcomes, though. It, 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 so, so it would be, I don't know about 0.5, but so if it's behavior at one moment and behavior at the next, it's not, and are, are they associated in terms of evaluative valence? And what's the reason for thinking it should be chance? Uh, I'm not saying I think it should be. I'm thinking if you just, if it, if you just, if it was just like, one day I, I pick up my coffee mug and a week later I don't. Um, that just sounds like it's just a random thing. I randomly pick okay, up. Okay, so, so or, or, one, or, or one day you pick up your coffee mug and the next day you do um, five sun salutations. But then it would be, ze then the correlation, the, the, the value to valence would be associated closer to zero, right? Because there'd be no relation. Things could be negative. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. They, so they could be. So it could turn. So so it it it, it could turn out that um right um three three bottles of claret is negatively associated with your training run for the marathon, right? right, right, right. No, 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 no. It's no. So so in a way, um. I'm not the best person to explain this, but the basic the basic point about correlations again it ain't fancy. Right. Question? Uh, what is being exactly is being correlated here? Those are, ter those are, labeled, yeah. oh, okay. those yeah. are labeled as behaviors, but what are the personality characteristics? Oh, no. Here we're just, this goes back to your early question. Here we're just looking for regularity and behavior, and we're correlate. You say, well, bragging is evidence of being a braggart. And then if someone is a braggart, there should be a strong relationship between brag at time one and brag at time two. Right. So here we're looking for behavioral regularities that you might take as indicative of traits. Okay, but then, so the part B of the question then is, what exactly do those numbers mean? Are you, you've got discrete observations every 18 minutes or whatever it is no, no, no. over a time period. They get pooled, so those get, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, so you, you pool all of the bragging behaviors from one weekend, so you're doing some aggregation, okay? And then those pooled behavior with all the bragging behaviors on the next weekend, right? So this is not one to one. So you already have some aggregation, which should what drive the drive the, drive the associations up. <clears throat> so then, question: If I'm right, why is common sense so wrong? Turns out there's an industry about this stuff. Social cognition, social perception is often inaccurate um, and inflected with various biases. In particular been shown many times, people tend to overemphasize personality and underestimate circumstance in interpreting behavior. Some of the work, this work gets done at the um, <clears throat> NIMI lab in Uris Hall, but um, it's, a, it's an old idea. Um, some of you may have even heard of this. Um, the tendency is so pervasive that Lee Ross coined the moniker the fundamental attribution era, era, era for over-attributing, over-attributing um, behavior to personality. <clears throat> so here's, a, here's a, a simpler diagnosis. Character judgments are usually based on samples that are both skewed and small. So um, in the sample she has, my spouse finds me irritating, but she's never seen what a charmer I am in the classroom, right? Um, so, 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 so she has a confident judgment and it's based on a, not a lot of observations, surprisingly few observations in a certain way if you think about it given that you sleep and work, um, and they're skewed to certain kinds of situations. Right. So I'm irritating on house cleaning 
Day, but charming on Business Ethics Day. Just ask them. Okay. So, take home. Character ain't destiny. Instead, instead the right thing to say is character is sometimes a perceptible part of destiny. Um, and if we want to make the world a better place, we need to focus interventions on other things. And that's all. Thanks. So you, you seem to take character as though it comes first. And it's not, I judge your character on how you behave. That's how I, what I think happens. That's the attribution, right? So you, um, you behave honestly, and I conclude that you're honest. That's what I imagine the attribution process is. Okay. Um, but, but I'm not seeing all the other time. You know, I, I haven't seen your tax so, returns. So it's by a sample as much as anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, 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 that's what seems to explain the mistake. That's what I'm claiming, yeah. Yeah. It, it would seem that context is important in all of this. So I'm just wondering, both on the, on the side of, of so-called character traits and then certainly on the side of behaviors, if, if, for example, you had a character trait of honesty or lawfulness or something mm -hmm. like that, uh, on the one hand, do you exceed the speed limit ever? Okay, a very minor infraction. On the other extreme, let's say murder, mm -hmm. you commit murder. Which is uncommon, so, right? Yeah, so, but, but the point is that the context here, how you define those terms, yeah, seem yeah. to be totally determinative of, of the outcome. Or very substantially determinative of the outcome. Well, here, so, so here's one way you might think I'm cooking the books, in that I'm suggesting lawfulness is. So, so, so here's what's true. Um, how how consistent we are depends on how we build the trait construct, right? So, my construct of lawfulness could be no homicide, but speed all you want. And then someone could have be inconsistently lawful, but consistent on my construct, right? And then what I want to claim is, is that um, moral constructs like honesty, loyalty, have pretty demanding standards of consistency. But maybe not all traits do. Here's a, so take witty, right? Um, um, <clears throat> you know, it, we don't think that the witty person only says witty things. It's dependent on context, and we, forget, we forgive them lapses. Um, you don't say, I used to think Doris was witty until I heard him arguing with his plumber. Right, right. So it's absolutely true that, in a, and I think this is actually what's going on in some of the debate, it's absolutely true that even with the numbers agreed upon, there are conceptual fights to have about how we build our constructs. And consistency is always going to be relative to the constructs we build. And then I don't really think it's cooking the books, but the way I've rigged the game is to say, and the moral traits we care about have a lot of consistency built in. I have a couple of questions from the online audience. One I think you've just been touching on, so you might want to briefly do that one, and then I'll read the second one as well. This one's from David. He says, I've seen about 10 talks by John Doris over the past 15 years. Prior to this talk, I could have predicted that he'd be funny in the way that he was and that he'd have various clear psychological insights. He's witty, sharp, and clear. Are Flattery these... will get you nowhere, Shoemaker. <laughs> uh, are these not character traits that have predictive power? So, there, so everybody's an interactionist, and they think the, the outcome uh, um, is... Um, involves both behaviors and situations, right? And so um, that my performances are relatively consistent across repeated trials of a very similar idiosyncratic performance space shouldn't surprise anybody, right? Um, and then whether I'm similarly persuasive um, in court when I'm suing the contractor who's built me out of thousands, that's a different question. 
Great. And then Jonathan asks, uh, what do you make of George Santos in these terms, personality or circumstance, or is his case exceptional and not typical? Yes. <laughs> so, so, so here, here, I actually, so I, the man people know this, but the, I'm surprised this doesn't happen to me more, but my, the, deck, the original deck of slides completely crashed. And so I had to make them up again and, you know, which didn't, didn't, you know, I made a few slide decks, but so I had to start over and I had a set of slides that answered this question and it goes like this. Someone says, what about extreme personalities? Aren't there people, I, I don't know what to think about George Santos. I haven't followed it that closely. Um, but let's say George Santos is plausibly a psychopath, right? So these are people in the vernacular, lack conscience, lack empathy, blah, 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 tend to be glib liars like Santos is, and so on and so forth. Um, Ted Bundy's another different kind of example. When you cross, fortunately it's a small piece of the Venn diagram, but when you cross um, psychopathy and sexual sadism, you get serial killers, um, um, because they don't have any behavioral controls of the right sort. But, here's the thing, it is true that people suffering um, psychopathologies behave in um, more consistent ways than the rest of us. Indeed, consistency is an earmark of psychopathology. Everybody's sad sometimes. <laughs> What's noticeable about the depressive person is they're too consistently sad, right? Um, here's the thing about even with psychopaths, Pick a behavior of interest, and this has been intensively studied, say recidivism, re-arrest, do they re-offend? Um, somebody guess what's the correlation between psychopathy and recidivism in most studies? Point three. <laughs> so so I did, I've been working on this because there's now this construct of corporate, corporate psychopathy that's big in management, and I started reading these things and people are saying, Corporate psychopathy um, correlates at 0.9 with um, um, employee satisfaction. And I'm like, Shh. again, that's impossible. So I go to the study, and it's, here's the study. Do you think your boss is a psychopath? Do you think he's a jerk? And those are highly correlated, it turns out. Um, um, so then I started looking at the serious psychopathy literature. I'm not saying no corporate psychopathy literature is interesting. And it, you, you would think if anyone's consistent, it's a psychopath, but you still don't get the intuitively robust relationships between psychopathy and what you might think of as um, psychopathy characteristic behavior, like criminally offending. So Santos should be more consistent with the rest of us than the rest of us um, with regard to a certain kind of glib dissembling. That might well be true, but um, it's more complicated than that, I think. I was curious about the Milgram experiment. Do you know if we have testimonies of the participants being regretful about what they did? This is a pretty big, so we know they were unhappy at the time and thought they were doing something bad. Um, I'm a fan. Um, but I think it's fair to say Milgram was fairly sloppy and self-serving with the debriefs. And so he kind of focused on, aren't you glad that you helped science advance by being so creepy? And everybody's like, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, and so people have now, you know, the, the, the archives were sealed for a long time and the identities were pretty closely held. But for example, in Gina Perry's book, she um, um, finds some people and interviews them. Um, and I think it's safe to say it was pretty traumatizing. And at least for, you know, there's a small number of people who were like, so he's dead, I did my job. Right, you know, those people are unusual. Um, and um, I, th I think of it like this. It's one thing to say, geez, two thirds of the people do it. I might do it. And that's hella different than um, I did it. Right, and so my guess is feel, people feel pretty awful even after finding out that they didn't really harm people. But we know less than they, we should, I think. So I was asking because... Oh, she had a plan. 
<laughs> I'm wondering if regret or the feeling that I don't recognize myself in what I did speaks to something similar to character or I mean that there is this um, consistency of something oh. that makes so even if you didn't act as you should have given your character trait, but then the fact that you feel regretful might mean that well you know that that's not yourself. So, so I'm just wondering if it's the same to say that character is not consistent. So as saying that character can sometimes be masked. I think this is see if this works. I think this is. A, a way of asking David Lee's question about the constructs in a way. So here's a possibility, and this gets floated in the literature from time to time. Um, but my father used to say there's not much difference between people, but what difference there is makes a lot of difference. Um, and, and so you might say something like this, um, a lot of similarity in behavior. But you're a very different animal if you're, you're traumatized and feel terrible, and if you don't. And what that suggests, and you know, people have, in fact, our own Roger Kampikar has pushed a line like this, right? It's not just behavioral performances that matter for characters, effective and cognitive performances, and maybe some of those are more consistent. So that, I think that's hard to rule out. I'm kind of unpersuaded, um, um, but, but that, that Certainly, you don't rule that out just by the 65% in Milgram. Were the people in the experiment who said, I won't do it? Uh, um, in the 65% ref refers to a handful of the 20 or so variations he, he ran. He, he varied them a lot. But yeah, 35% people, 35 said no way. Right, right. So, so, so a chunk said no way. And then some might say, well, those are the people with good character. And then I, and I want to say, are you sure they wouldn't do something awful in another situation? Right. But it's true that it's a one-off thing. And so being defiant in Milgram and not going all the way does seem, you could take that as evidence of something good. That's why you need the effect size stuff to make it work, to make the skeptical argument about character work. I'm curious about how much this uh, holds across types of character traits. Uh, if you think there might be any variation between certain kinds of character traits, so like abstention-based character traits, so somebody who doesn't drink, uh, somebody who you know very seriously doesn't drink, uh, for instance, across a whole range of situations, they're going to say no to alcohol, right? Uh, really, really varied kinds of situations at parties, when they're at home, when they're at the bar, driving by the bar, um, and there are some moral uh, traits that seem you know, uh, abstention-based, so like, if you think that eating meat is wrong, right, all the vegetarians that I know always, across all situations, say no when they're offered meat. Well, actually, ve vegetarians are famous for lapsing. <laughs> there ought to be a category for veg vegetarians save bacon. <laughs> uh, um, but, but, no, you're right, I mean, but, it, so, <laughs> so, take the recovered alcoholic who's reliably abstemious. I want to say that's a behavior. And of course, lapsing is famous and kind of, uh, all right. In, in fact, we know that now they think, um, you know, now there's, so the abstemious model is very much due to AA. And now lots of experts say, we want a harm minimization model. We expect lapses, so on and so forth. But sure. Um, I was saying that it's the same for all, for all traits, that the point three applies. I would expect some kind of variation. I'm not sure if abstemious is the right, um, is the right, um, is a trait in the right way. Um, but surely some people behave consistently. But again, um, it's bad when you ruin your own talk. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's not me. Is there some? It sounds like you. It does. It does. But then why didn't it stop when I turned it off? I don't understand those things. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, I don't understand those things. Anyway, so back, back, back to you. Um, notice 
what are the people, the people who do succeed, what do they have? Social support, right? That's what's good about AA, right? And they manage situations and so on and so forth. So again, we've got this interaction between individual and person. And I want to say the people who succeed, the people who succeed have the right situations. Um, some addictions, um, some addictions um, experts think quitting cigarettes is harder than quitting heroin. Um, here's one partial diagnosis. Um, you can avoid your you can avoid your using friends. You can't avoid 7-Eleven. Okay, so it, there's just a situational availability for tobacco. It, it, there might there, there might there doesn't have to be a deep structural difference, right, Sarah? Yeah, sorry, I was trying to write down all my notes on my phone, so I apologize. Maybe it's you. Who, I'm going to blame you for that. Oh problem. yeah, yeah. So I'm actually messaging it to you. Um, <laughs> so okay, I'm I'm I. Oh, this is great. I'm inclined to agree that, you know, character is fairly inconsistent, but it makes me concerned because it makes me think about how, like, any other psychological constructs are also inconsistent. Yep. And so it seems like the argument that you make is, well, it's important for character to be consistent because that's literally the very definition to some extent. That's what I think. And yeah. so what if character then is not defined as consistency across most scenarios, but instead it's like when a person has a set of good moral behaviors that shows up more often than like the average person. Yeah. So when I describe someone as being patient and having good character, I'm not saying they're always patient. Mm -hmm. I'm saying they're generally more patient than the average person. Yeah. So they have like a 0.3 correlation yeah. that's perceptible yeah. to me. Whereas uh, other people with their behaviors might be like a 0.1 correlations across it. So it's not perceptible to me. So good, good. So maybe it's just, so, so in actually, this would be in the weeds about how to think about this stuff, but the effect sizes we see do justify comparative judgments. Yeah. Right. So one person is more honest than another. They're just not honest in absolute terms. Various philosophers have been drawn to this baseball analogy. Character is like, um, character is like, batting averages, right? And so you know nobody expects someone to bat a thousand, and. I have a hard time seeing why this is not rankly dumb um, for moral cases. So Ted Williams was the last person to hit 400. That means he failed more than he succeeded. So imagine that we use the batting average thing, which gets your comparative judgments, for marital fidelity. And so then I say, well, I'm at 400, and that cat over there is at 300. You know, and then so my spouse says, um, I'm not saying John's loyal. That's not, I'm saying he's more loyal than the next person or more loyal than my next door neighbor. I think we've changed the subject. I, I think those things are valuable to know. I mean, loyalty is a special case to the extent it's one strike and you're out, right? But um, when you go for these kinds of comparative judgments that do seem to fall out of, fall, fall out of what we know, I think you're just playing a different game than the character game. And then there are questions in philosophy of science or theory choice more generally. When have you amended the theory and when have you changed the subject? Is there an agreed upon set of traits, character traits? No. Um, Aristotle had, so do you have seven? Or, so there are four cardinal virtues, right? And so people have different lists. Interestingly, the parsimonious theories are in psychology where we have the big five and the big six, which are supposed to give an exhausting account of behavior. The lists tend to be pretty small. The pra so this would again speak to what David was saying. They tend to be understood as pretty broad. You don't hear people talking about... Um, philosophy lecture extroversion. And those, tra th th those might be traits, actually. Right, right. So the broad ones, the, the ones of tradition tend to be broad. Just, and, and, and people are really narrow, then you get clear different correlations. Yes, so yes. Broad, and yep. So yep. Kind of yep. What... Well, uh, so 
The, I call these local traits, but we could also call them highly qualified traits, right? And so we've got a qualified um, trait uh, of um, lecture hall extroversion. We've got someone who's courageous when mountaineering, um, but not courageous when telling their spouse they gambled away the paycheck, right? And so once you start carving them so fine, it looks like you're just pointing out behavioral regularities and not talking about broad traits like extroversion. So I would, I would claim that's a change of subject with respect to the tradition. Like, I guess in some ways, I was going to ask, I was just, uh, you know, you said character isn't everything, but it is something. Yeah. It is something. Yeah. So here's a, so I didn't, I didn't go in, the, you know, for reasons of length, but here's the kind of thing it, I think it buys you. So in the HR literature, they have integrity tests, and these are predictive of, um, Performance at work, what's called counterproductive workplace behaviors, calling in sick, stealing, that kind of stuff. And um, so, for example, Dave Sherman and one of his colleagues at the hotel school did a study with a, hooked up with a big company, did integrity tests. The integrity tests are pretty cheap to run. Um, and you save about 70 bucks an employee. Um, in terms of time lost? Well, um, let's say the test costs 10 bucks, you're plus 60 an employee, you have 50,000 employees, guess what? Um, that's a big plus. So the little difference is aggregate. By the way, this is the way also it works with, um, in the vicinity nobody's asked, this is the way it works with intelligent tests and employment. Um, predict job performance, not super robustly, what's called incremental validity, 0.16. Again, not super noticeable, 0.19, not super noticeable at the individual level. But if you're in the U.S. Army and you make, you know, 300,000, I don't know, a half million personnel decisions a year, and you do a little bit better on each one, that aggregates to real savings. Okay, so, so it matters a lot, just not quite in the way that you thought on the individual level. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you.